Good evening. Welcome, everybody. Thank you all for coming. My name is Susan Sayer, and on behalf of our Regents Point's Topical Programs Committee, I thank you all for coming to our presentation on the history of the Armenian genocide, or Armenian-Azerbaijan conflict, also referred to as the Armenian Genocide. The presentation will be followed by a question and answer period. Our presenter this evening is Dr. Kevin Abajajian. I think I should get sort of right. Okay. And it's sort of a bit of a tongue twister. <laughs> Kevin is a professor of physics and astronomy at UCI, the director of the Center of Cosmology at UCI, and he's a commissioner on Irvine's Sustainability Commission. Kevin is an immigrant from Armenia coming to the US when Armenia was still under the rule of the Soviet Union. He is the chair of the Orange County Armenian Genocide Memorial Committee, which just got approval from the Great Park Board to create an Armenian Genocide Memorial in the Great Park. Kevin also serves on multiple genocide memorial, uh, on multiple and local national Armenian committees and organizations. I now hand you over to Kip. Thank you, Susan, um, and thank you. Oh, this is wireless, so we can walk, walk around. All right. Um, so uh, thank you, Susan, uh, for the kind introduction, and uh, thanks for the invitation, too. Um, I don't know if you know Susan very well, but she's a force of nature in our local community, uh, in the civic advocacy at the municipal level, and uh, when she asks for something, it's hard to say no. Uh, she's just a wonderful addition to what goes on in Irvine uh, at large. Um, so, um, so as, as Susan mentioned, I am a, um, an immigrant from Armenia, and I was five years old when my parents came. But as you'll hear, I'm actually my roots are not from the Republic of Armenia, from, from elsewhere. And um, so I'll, I'll share that with you. Um, and you know, although the topic of genocide is um, very uh, grim, it is. Um, there, little pointer there. Um, it is a grim topic. I, I do want to just tell you a bit about the Armenian community as well, that we're, we're something beyond uh, the worst event that ever happened to us. So, um, however, it is also uh, very recent. So, as I'll tell you about, uh, the genocidal events to Armenians started in the late 19th century in some ways. A lot of communities faced them even before then. Uh, and uh, they're continuing even to the present day. And last year, we saw a mass expulsion of Armenians from their ancestral indigenous homelands uh, just in September of last year. And that's, uh, that's what, what the whole thesis of what I'm going to be talking about is that this genocide is continuing today. Um, so I'm a faculty member in physics and astronomy, but I have a lot of interests in including uh, the history of my own people. So talking about history, I'm going to give you like 9,000 years worth in 45 minutes. Um, so Armenians are actually indigenous to their community for since about 7,800 BC. And we know that because um, uh, this is way slower than it's supposed to be because it's not my computer. But um, the identity of Armenians is uh, first identified in the 6th century BC with a blend of Indo-Europeans from uh, Eastern Europe, uh, blended with the local people called the Urartu people, uh, who were present in that region since the 13th century BC. Uh, the 6th century BC is when this concept of Armenia first arose, and uh, uh, from the, a tribe actually called the Armens, and Armen is actually a common name in, Arme in Armenian uh, heritage. Uh, my brother's name is Armen. Um, and what's interesting is that the genealogical measures of the DNA of modern-day Armenians actually uh, connects with uh, skeletal remains that have been tied that from 7,800 years ago uh, very strongly, uh, including uh, uh, Armenians in, in, uh, in Artsakh. Um, so um, so the, um, if you look at other uh, ancient populations located in that, in that uh, modern-day Armenian Artsakh, um, 
and really covers um, the connection between Armenians and the people in uh, Armenians of Artsakh connects with the uh, folks from 7,800 years ago more than uh, 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 anybody else in the region. Uh, another kind of cool thing, Armenians are the first people to uh, develop uh, leather shoes. This is a 5,500-year-old shoe that was discovered um, just a year ago. Wow. Um, and uh, uh, leather shoe with, with laces, with a lace-type structure. And uh, in the same region, actually, they found artifacts of winemaking. So uh, Armenians were one of the first to create wine. Um, we're really a thriving community on, in all the major continents where people are. And I, I wanted to, to highlight this instead of just... Uh, Again, genocide. There are 3.2 million Armenians in the Republic of Armenia today, and there are 8 million Armenians in the diaspora, including me. So if you look at where they're distributed, uh, this is uh, the darker con colored uh, countries are where there's um, more Armenians. There's more than a million in the United States, more than a million in Russia, um, and there's all over, all over the world. Um, too quick for once. Um, these are images from uh, a really great book. I got a copy as a uh, for Christmas gift last Christmas, although I've seen uh, images from it before. Uh, it's called There is Only One Earth, and it's by an Armenian photographer named Scout Tufankia, Tufankjan. Um, and uh, some of these images are available, and uh, with attribution, I'm sharing them here. Just about the life of Armenians, and they're amazing photos all over the world. These are uh, Armenian diaspora members in Beirut, Lebanon. These are of uh, 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 folks making a uh, dolma in Paris, yeah. France, yeah. which is a uh, stuffed grape leaf. Uh, here's uh, Armenians dancing in Toronto, Canada. Uh, here's a religious service uh, uh, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Armenian uh, uh, folks participating. This is an Armenian uh, school in Sydney, Australia. This is an Armenian club in Calcutta, India. So there's our people, yeah. Indian folks who have heritage that are Armenians. And locally, uh, this is a photo from the book as well, in Little Armenia in West Hollywood, uh, there's a large Armenian community, and, uh, one of the largest outside of Armenia itself. Um, and this is probably on one of the Armenian Genocide Commemoration Days on April 24th. Uh, so we're all over the place, but where, we're, where we started is over here in this region. On the little black dot, is Armenia proper, the Republic of Armenia today. So, um, but we didn't start just in that tiny spot. Uh, Armenians are indigenous to the highlands of eastern Anatolia or Asia Minor uh, and the Caucasus. And so this is a, a very strange projection of the current map of the world, uh, but it is a very nice one because it, it maps out uh, the presence of Armenians in the region. The blue, darker blue, are regions with a higher fraction of Armenians. This lightest blue is actually the largest fractions. So here, here, and here. Um, and uh, if you can imagine uh, the modern Republic of Turkey is, is here, this peninsula that juts out this way. This is in present-day modern eastern Turkey, and then the Republic of Armenia sits here. And, um, uh, and uh, right here is the Republic of Armenia. So this is where we were. We were uh, distributed in the Armenian highlands and also a large presence near the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, but kind of a diffuse uh, distribution of folks that have been there uh, since, as I said, 1700 BC. This is another projection, although it respects current geographical boundaries, so it doesn't have modern Armenia here. This is just the Armenian population as it was in the geographical borders of present-day Turkey. Um, again, darker colors are a larger fraction, going up to 40 to 50 percent and above in the easternmost regions. Um, this is a more historic map uh, that includes uh, kind of the present-day Armenia, although it doesn't have a cutout for the exclave of Nahichivan. But this is basically the modern-day Armenia, the light uh, brown region. The first republic that was founded in 1918 is in red. Um, President Woodrow Wilson thought that that republic should be up to the red line. And um, the influence of Armenians really in the region was in the dot, uh, dashed lines prior to the genocide of 1915. And kind of uh, some Armenians like our own imperialistic era back in 70 BC when uh, Tigran the Great 
uh, conquered a republic or an empire that extended towards the uh, the dark, the, the shaded kind of orange region. So, um, so what what how does genocide fit into this? Well, uh, genocide by international law is 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 a well defined thing. It's defined by a convention, a treaty, and um, it it was actually the the concept or the establishment of genocide as as, as a legal entity was a lifetime project of Raphael Lemkin. He, he was a, a Jewish attorney from Poland, and he saw the rise of uh, Nazi Germany and tried to convince his parents to leave Poland because he knew what was coming. His parents refused to listen. He left, and they were, they were caught up in the Holocaust. And his whole life's mission was to get the act of genocide to be uh, to become a crime. Uh, he actually was a law student, and he asked his uh, supervisor, "What, you know, why is it that countries like uh, the Ottoman Empire can go and kill their Armenian population, and there's no consequence?" And his law professor, mentor, said, "Well, you know, it's like a farmer. If he has chickens, he can kill the chickens. There's nothing you can do about." It. Whoa. And that was the status of international law up to that point. Um, there was no international way to stop a country from deciding that some segment of this population should be eliminated. Uh, so his goal was to get this to be illegal internationally. And he had that, he actually fulfilled his goal. He got the United Nations to adopt the UN Genocide Convention, which he authored. And that convention says that genocide means any of the following acts uh, committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group um, as such. So killing members of the group, causing serious bodily harm uh, or mental harm to the members of the group, um, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life uh, calculated to bring out its uh, physical destruction in all or in part. And um, this was adopted as a, a convention uh, in, the, in the late 1940s. Um, and so where did, where did, you know, the, the example that Rafael used was the elimination of the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. It was the leading example for genocide that he would give. Um, uh, even during the Holocaust, as it was unfolding, uh, he would say that it was it, the Armenians are a, 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 an example of genocide. And uh, you know, a lot of folks uh, attribute the date of 1915 to the Armenian genocide start, but really it had started. Its, its start was before that, up to, back to 1892. And the first photos I showed was a woman who was a widow from uh, her husband was killed in the in these massacres in the 1890s, called the Hamidian massacres. Um, and um, uh, that photo from 1899. Uh, in, the, in the late 19th century, the Ottoman Empire was kind of called the sick man of Europe. It, it was an empire that was on decline. It, um, it's economically and, and culturally kind of was in decline. And uh, it controlled um, Balkan areas in Europe. And the European PM powers at the time said, you know, you should let the, the Balkans have self-determination. And about the same time, the Armenian population, you saw, which had over 50% in Eastern, uh, Eastern Asia Minor, they actually uh, also said, hey, well, if the Balkans get independence and self-determination, we should too. And they actually sent a delegation in 1878 to the Congress of Berlin to lobby European states to include protections that the Balkans were getting for the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire as part of a, what was at the time in 1878 a peace treaty between Russia and Turkey after their war. Uh, these protections actually never got enforced and in fact kind of backfired. There was further repressions. Armenians always had a second class status in the courts and in tax law and everything. Uh, it even caused for more, more oppression. And in fact it caused uh, the formation of these Hamidiye regiments that were basically responsible for white scale massacres. Um, hundreds of thousands killed uh, from 1892 through 1897, kind of two waves of killing. Uh, they subsided in 1897. So remember, they started in 1892. It wasn't until 1897 that European powers had enough influence to stop 
what was happening from continuing. Um, I'm not going to show many years of pictures, but just because this, this particular massacre is so not known, I wanted to share. Um, many, many were killed during this time. Um, and um, uh, the widely recognized Armenian genocide that President Biden actually is the first president to, uh, after President Reagan actually, in 1981 President Reagan acknowledged it but then didn't for the remainder of his term, but then uh, President Biden has every, every year since 2021. No, yeah, 2020, 2021. Uh, that, this widely recognized Armenian genocide is largely uh, dictated to the dates of 1915 through 1923. Um, and it starts. It started with the momentous thing that happened on April 24th of that year, 1915, where the Ottoman uh, government decided to arrest all of the intellectuals uh, and um, and expel the intellectuals from the city of Constantinople. Many of which uh, met their fate uh, uh, by death, and others uh, managed to survive and make it to outside of the uh, uh, outside of the uh, uh, Asia Minor. Uh, Turkey, um, and uh, the really the ringleader was a man named uh, Talat Pasha. Although there was kind of a committee that was responsible for the for this, um, uh, it's it's hard to get an exact estimate. Uh, the number of people that were marched uh, between 1915 and 1916 into the Syrian desert from Asia Minor was uh, between 800,000 and 1.2 million. Um, so these death marches were um, really characterized by the most extreme and vile things that could happen to humans. Um, the kind of paramilitary groups that were involved, that were kind of the subsequent uh, or, uh, um, the successors to the media uh, regiments, um, did all sorts of terrible things. Like people were dying of dehydration, starvation, uh, sexual violence was common, widespread killings along the way. Um, as well as in the in Asia Minor proper, there are a lot of uh, books about what has happened from 1915 to 1923, and I'm not going to um, go over all of the details of that period. But I wanted to highlight some things that don't don't uh, don't get as much attention. Uh, between 100,000 and 200,000 Armenians are estimated to have actually been uh, women and children. Largely, were the ones that, that were allowed to survive if they were. Um, if they converted to Islam and assimilated with the uh, Muslim families. Um, and um, 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 so these, these massacres and, and ethnic cleansing, uh, you might think it was tied to the World War I, but actually ex extended well beyond that. Um, and into the period between 1920 and 1923 uh, with the Turkish War of Independence, which was perpetrated by Turkish nationalists. Uh, this is uh, just one of the images of uh, a line of people being forced out of their village uh, in, during the Armenian Genocide of 1915 through 23. Uh, and this is uh, a map that was produced by uh, Robert Hansen in his uh, book um, um, on the genocide of how there was just a systematic effort to move folks from Asia Minor. This is Turkey, Turkey's boundaries roughly today. Um, and from the, uh, Constantinople and all the more larger populations of Armenians in eastern Turkey uh, into the deserts of Syria, where the largest killings occurred. Uh, killings occurred along the whole way, but um, a, a lot happened um, at the end stage of the, of the marches. Um, my own family story starts in three different places here. Tekir Dog is where my grandfather, Kevor uh, Gabazajian, um, uh, was separated from his father, Nazar Abazanji, uh, who was too ill to travel and was left uh, by him and his mother. And uh, he wound up, I'm not sure exactly which arrows he followed, but the most common arrow through here was uh, from here to here to here to here. And my, my grandfather uh, made it to Mosul, uh, Iraq, current Iraq, here. And my father was born uh, in that city. My great-grandmother, uh, my grandmother's side, is from Saloz, which is a small town about here, and she made a similar path. Uh, she lost her son, who was five years old, and her husband during the march. Uh, she was separated from her uh, uh, eight or ten-year-old daughter, 
uh, and she wasn't reunited with her until 1965 wow. with, the, with the efforts of the Red Cross. Her daughter wound up in Bulgaria. Uh, she met her uh, her husband in, in uh, Mosul, uh, who was actually from the region of Urfa, and uh, she created a second family that became my family uh, in Mosul. And then her children, her daughter, found my grandfather, and uh, that's where my, my heritage comes from. So even though I was born in Armenia, which is in this, I was born in Yerevan here, my heritage is actually from Western Armenia. Uh, so genocidal violence, actually, this is something that doesn't get as reported, it occurred from 1920 through 23. Uh, some, some accounts uh, will end Armenian genocide in 1916 or 17, but really um, there's, uh, the massacres occurred along uh, for, for years on separate fronts. Um, during the Turkish War of Independence, along its eastern front, which I'll say a bit more about Armenian refugees that had returned to Cilicia in southern Turkey in 1921, which is that region in the, near the Mediterranean that had an Armenian population, they were targeted again. And then the, uh, there was um, a, a targeted killing against the Greek army in uh, occupied Smyrna in 1922, uh, and where um, uh, also the final remaining Armenian community in Anatolia was located. Uh, the Turkish Grand National Assembly, whose president was Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, uh, gave orders to the commander of the Eastern Front Forces in the Turkish War of Independence. And that uh, commander's name was Kazim Karabakir. And the, this is a written record that he said to eliminate Armenia physically and politically from the map. At this time, there was an independent Armenia that survived for a few short years after World War I. And uh, Ataturk's command was to eliminate that state, both physically and politically which is a genocidal command. Um, so this is a clear intent to commit genocide of Armenians by the government led by Ataturk. And that's why Armenians find the glorification of Ataturk so problematic. Disney actually had a glorifying do documentary, um, Child or you know, Antwerp Children of Ataturk. It was actually pulled by Disney because of the reaction by the Armenian community. Um, so it didn't happen. Because it, these kinds of documentaries don't show the full history of, of this person. Um, so under these orders, Karabakir invaded the Armenian Republic and massacred 60 to 100,000 more Armenians in their indigenous ancestral homeland of the, of the uh, First Republic of Armenia. Simultaneously in this period, 1920, uh, Russian communist Bolsheviks invaded the Republic of Armenia from the north and declared that portion of the Republic of Armenia to be part of the Soviet Union. Uh, under the Treaty of Moscow, which was in 1921, the Russians and, and Turkish nationalists uh, have a peace treaty of brotherhood, they called it, in Mount Ararat, which is a symbol of Armenian people, was actually given, seceded to Turkey by the Russians, by the Bolsheviks. Um, and uh, basically the genocidal campaign of, Turk, of Ataturk was rewarded. The, far, the western side of the Republic of Armenia you know, of 1918 was handed to uh, Turkey and the entire Armenian population of that region of that part of the public was eliminated, either by death or by eviction. So, um, you know, this is a sordid history, and um, and it includes a denial, a denial of the crimes against humanity and, and, uh, and uh, people. Uh, even in, during the times, during the time of 1915 through 1923, uh, folks in uh, the, those in, uh, in charge in, in Turkey denied that it was happening. They said it was just a resettlement campaign. Um, and uh, so that's not changed. It's completely the same position of the Republic of Turkey today, that what happened in that time period was not genocide, was not a crime against humanity. It was just a conflict, some people died. People died on all sides. Um, however, the targeted campaign of eliminating army population is well documented within Turkish records and historians and university agree uh, it's a genocide. Uh, so the continuing denial, denial and cover-up um, um, uh, of the genocide, and actually some of the records have been destroyed in Turkey, are really kind of, a, it's really a continuation of the crime of genocide, because uh, you know, covering up of a crime uh, in many cases, and in this case, from the convention, is also uh, part of the crime. It's complicity in the crime. Um, 
Azerbaijan is a different country than Turkey. They are Turkic people. Uh, uh, they speak a Turkic language with their distinct uh, uh, sovereign state. However, they have the same genocide denial of genocide uh, position as the Republic of Turkey. Um, the president of Turkey, Erdogan, has said that Azerbaijan and Turkey are one nation, two states. And this really goes for their policy of genocide denial as well. Uh, and, you, and you'll see uh, that the denial of genocide is actually, it goes hand in hand with the continuation of it, which uh, frankly, is, is, as genocide experts have said, is happening continually. Um, and one of the things that really makes genocide hard to acknowledge as happening is that that UN convention, I read you Article 2, but Article 1 says something even more profound, which is that the contracting parties of the UN Genocide Convention are required to act. The contracting parties affirm that genocide, whether committed in time of peace or in time of war, is a crime under international law, which they undertake to prevent and to punish. So those that acknowledge that it's genocide have an obligation to act. So um, there's been not only physical elimination of the people by death or by, by uh, expulsion, forced displacement, um, there's also been a, a complete removal of the traces of the victims. Um, uh, Raphael Lemkin, who actually, as I said, led its efforts for recognition of, of the international crime of genocide, he actually wanted to include the uh, elimination of the culture of the people as part of the crime. Uh, because, um, you know, if, if, you, um, if you are eliminating a people, eliminating their culture is one and the same. Um, and so um, um, that's what that says. All right, so, um, uh, so these are just some of the numbers um, uh, of the t at the time. Uh, I won't maybe I won't go through them in detail because it's taking so long much time. But um, uh, in 1914, prior to the Armenian Genocide's largest phase, uh, we went, they went from about 2,549 religious sites, uh, which were not even an exhaustive list. Uh, but um, in, 20, in 1974, UNESCO found that there had only been 464 sites, uh, oh, sorry, 464 completely destroyed, uh, 913 were in some condition, um, and only about 197 were actually uh, sufficiently intact to be considered usable. So you went from 2,500 to about 200. Um, and this isn't actually just happening, you know, back in 1915 through 1974. Uh, Azerbaijan has been eliminating any trace of Armenians in their territory much more recently. And we're talking like today through uh, uh, at the 1990s. Um, so, um, uh, so in regions of, of Artsakh, which is uh, uh, a mountainous region of, uh, inhabited by Armenians, um, many uh, documented churches have been eliminated. The BBC has reports of people uh, uh, going and finding these churches that have been uh, eliminated. Um, and Cornell University found that basically there's almost a complete eradication of the Armenian cultural heritage in an exclave called Nahi Javan, uh, which had a very large Armenian population uh, prior to the 1990s. Um, um, so Artsakh, which I'll uh, uh, talk a bit more about, um, has about 4,000 Armenian cultural sites, including almost 400 churches. Uh, these sites are now under Azerbaijani control, and it's basically considered that uh, they will do in Artsakh what they did in Nahichivan, which is eliminate all the cultural uh, heritage that they can possibly do. Um, so Artsakh, just to place it on this map, is here. Uh, it's just, to, it's kind of funny, it gets, always gets left off of the map. So there's still Armenians out here, but they didn't bother to want to map them out. Um, and it's just to just the edge of modern-day Armenia uh, uh, in, in what uh, was the Soviet Republic of, of uh, Azerbaijan, and unfortunately, the internationally regarded boundaries of the state of Azerbaijan. Um, 
So Artsakh was basically uh, considered as part of Armenia as, as far back as the second century BC. And as I mentioned before, the genetics of Armenians in Asia Minor and Artsakh are tied to the people in the region um, uh, uh, back to 1700 years ago. Um, it's uh, also, there's evidence, pretty, oh, let's go back, I don't, know. I don't want that to come. That's what happens when you don't use your computer. Yeah. So let's go back. There we go. Excuse me. Yeah. Would you mind, uh, when you say it's a uh, pinpoint that it's today, it's called Nakodar. Yeah, thanks. I should say that, yeah. Um, so, so I call it by the name, yeah, uh, Artsakh, which is the Armenian name for it. Um, a lot of folks, if you heard about it in the news, and I should have said this, thank you, um, uh, to map it on for you. Um, um, it is called Nagorno-Karabakh by uh, international, uh, uh, let's say, you know, civil society. Uh, and it's called Nagorno Karabakh because that was the Soviet name for it. Nagorno Karabakh is a combination of a Russian word and a Turkish word. Uh, Nagorno is Russian, Karabakh is uh, uh, Black Garden in Turkic, uh, Azeri. Uh, and uh, let's decolonize the place, in my view, and let's move the Russians and Turks out of there and call it by its Armenian name, which is Artsakh. Um, so that's what I call it. Um, so it is called the North Karabakh by, uh, by international uh, civil society. Um, so uh, uh, um, Armenians have lived in Artsakh for at least 2,000 years, and um, so, um, back in, um, uh, in 1920, actually, Artsakh was also subject to genocide by Azerbaijan during that Turkish War of Independence. Uh, hundreds were massacred in Shushi, which is a city within uh, uh, Nagorno Karabakh and Artsakh, um, and the entire population, entire Armenian population, was slaughtered in September 1920, with up to 20,000 killed. Uh, this was actually led by one of the young Turk perpetrators of Armenian genocide, Enver Pasha. Uh, so, in 1920, uh, Bolsheviks came to control. Um, this, the Soviet Socialist Republics of Armenia and Azerbaijan, as I said, they, they invaded from the north. Um, and in 1921, they were deciding how to divide up it, that territory into uh, republics. And there was a Caucasus Bureau, or called the Cod Bureau. And they met, um, and based on the uh, overwhelming Armenian population of Artsakh and Karabakh, placed it within this uh, Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic. Um, and uh, the next day, actually, July 5th, 1921, uh, Joseph Stalin actually intervened with the committee and overturned the decision, placing Artsakh as part of the Azerbaijani SSR. And this is well documented, because communists, if they did anything, they kept good records. Um, and this actually is a single decision that, decision that has been most critical to the fate of Armenians and Artsakh. What has happened in the past year is all started by this decision to place it within the Republic of, of um, Azerbaijan. Um, so ever since, actually, the Armenians of Artsakh were forced into Azerbaijan, they've worked actually within the Soviet system, as flawed and as brutalistic and totalitarian as it was, it had a system for trying to raise grievances. Um, and they tried to do that ever since uh, that decision in 1921 to try to get their own, um, uh, their own autonomy and even reunite with the Republic of Armenia. Unfortunately, because of uh, 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 oppression of Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh and Artsakh, the population went from 94% Armenian in 1923 to 76% in 1979. Um, you probably know this guy. Yep. Uh, you ever watched Nightline? Who watched Nightline back in the day? I did. I was like in eighth grade when this report came out, and I kind of remember it. Um, and he, he actually sums it up. It's going to take a good part of my, the rest of my time, but I, the, this report sums up the situation in 1988 better than I can. So, good evening. I'm Tim Koppel, and this is Nightline. For months, Soviet Armenians, by the tens of thousands, have been staging unprecedented and sometimes violent protests in their quest to reunify the Armenian people in one republic. It's a true test of Mikhail Gorbachev's 
policy of reform is a true test for him. That's our focus tonight. So remember at this time, Gorbachev said he was going to reform the Soviet Union, Chris Stryka, Lostness. That led to a new motivation to further the We are, perhaps more often than we would like to admit, the captives of what various governments and administrations, including our own, want us to show you. For some reason, when Mikhail Gorbachev strolls across Red Square with his guest Ronald Reagan, we and our cameras are powerless to resist. When Nancy Reagan is towed at something approaching breakneck speed, like a cultural water skier through the Hermitage Museum in Leningrad, we feel obliged to record and report the event. There are, of course, developments infinitely more important, but beyond our view, that we, therefore, find much more difficult to report. For the past week, tens of thousands of people have been demonstrating in Soviet Armenia. Dissidents claim that up to 300,000 people have taken part over the last week. Soviet officials give a much lower estimate, but even they can see daily demonstrations of about 15,000 people. We can't show you what is happening, but we can try to explain why it is happening. <laughs> Armenian is not just defined by a homeland because we, we just spread all over the world. <laughs> We're all united by the fact that we accept a common heritage. And of course, that heritage is rooted in Armenia itself. You know, people are territorial. Armenia is a very ancient Christian country. Uh, the beginning of the fourth century, Christianity became the state religion of Armenia. They have adhered to this faith, uh, being really on the dividing line between East and West. What happened to the Armenians in 1915 is that they became victims of the first genocide of the 20th century, planned and carried out by the Idahabist government of Turkey wartime government. They use as an excuse the fact that the Armenians were on the frontier with, with Russia and the war was going on uh, between the Ottoman Empire and the uh, Russian Empire. And the Armenians were in the way. It was a planned genocidal uh, activity that, that started. By the time it was finished, one and a half million People were dead, and the entire historic Armenian lands, where Armenians had lived for 3,000 years, was left totally barren. No Armenians there. Those that did survive fled all over the world. Some of them uh, located in Marseille, in France, and in Europe. Many went to the Middle East, many went to uh, South America. Uh, thousands of them came here to the United States. The comparison between uh, Armenians here and Armenians in the Soviet Union, I mean, you have a free society here, you have a communistic society over there. But now, with Krasnos, people are beginning to exercise their rights which have always been there in the Constitution, but never in fact, the first to implement that Constitution was the Soviet of Karabakh, the Assembly of Karabakh. Karabakh is situated uh, southeast of Armenia, sort of east-southeast, let's say. It has always been the uh, fortress of Armenian independence. The Karabakh, uh issue has, has more or less recently erupted. Um, right after World War I, there was an independent Armenian Republic, and it lasted, it survived for approximately two years. But then the government collapsed. Part of the lands were given to Turkey, and part of the lands were given to the Soviet government. Uh, the Republic of Armenia is one of 15 republics in the Soviet Union. And unfortunately, what happened was that the region of Karabakh was given over to Azerbaijan. Now, I say unfortunately because 
80% or more of the population of Karabakh are Muslims, whereas in Azerbaijan, they are Shiite Muslims. So Armenians in an area that is predominantly Armenian feel as if they're treated as second-class citizens, and they would rather be a part of the Armenian Republic, which is located right next door to them. Well, it's interesting the way this thing has happened. It's, it began in Karabakh. The people who are involved, the people who are uh, sort of fed up living the way they're living, uh, came out first and hit the streets and said, we want to be reunited. They made a decision, almost unanimous, in Karabakh, that they, are, they have decided to join the Armenian Republic rather than the Azerbaijan Republic. And the result of this, which should be interpreted as the implementation of Glasnost, caused riots, murders, and vantage. People simply identified as Armenians and killed. They've acknowledged that they've arrested over 100 uh, Azeris already for complicity in these, in these massacres. In uh, February, the demonstrations in Yerevan and Armenia began. Hundreds of thousands of people demonstrated. Um, in fact, the demonstrations had begun in Karabakh and Stepanak here to help the city to Karabakh. And then it was picked up and the people in Yerevan expressed their solidarity with the people in Karabakh. The largest, uh, most massive, uh, most extended demonstrations in the history of the Soviet Union I mean, it's the smallest republic, the uh, people of the smallest republic in Soviet Union. It's a true test of Mikhail Gorbachev's policy of reform. It's a true test for him. The one danger of what's been happening now in Azerbaijan is the fact that maybe the timing was wrong for the Armenians to demonstrate. If we could have only waited until Gorbachev was able to more firmly establish his control of the Communist Party. I think if you talk to Armenians um, deep down, what they are wishing for is that someday there will be a free, independent Armenians. So just to cut it off a little bit, but that is that is a good place to end it. That, that um, the real uh, urge was for a free and independent Armenia. Um, so. Um, uh, just to bring us up to this, the present day, that was 1988, not really that long ago. Um, and um, was that Armenians of Artsakh uh, were uh, wanting independence in 1991. They actually proclaimed independence uh, within their alignment, actually through that mechanism within the Soviet constitution. And also was consistent with uh, UN declarations for human rights and also the rights of indigenous, indigenous peoples. Unfortunately, that led to an all-out war with the collapse of the Soviet Union that turned out to be a war for independence for Nagorno-Karabakh, for Artsakh, um, and uh, it ended in 1994 yeah, with a ceasefire, and that ceasefire lasted 26 years. In September of 2020, um, Azerbaijan launched an unprovoked genocidal military assault onto that uh, territory. And uh, we were all busy, a lot of us, thinking about a presidential election coming up in September of 2020. Uh, so it was a good time to do it. And there was also this pandemic going on. Um, there was a ceasefire in November 2020 where um, um, a portion of that Soviet uh, Republic of Nagorno Karabakh Autonomous Oblast was ceded. Uh, and um, um, there were numerous war crimes actually during this uh, genocide assault. Uh, after the 2020 assault, uh, it ended with a three-way agreement between um, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Russia in November of 2020 uh, to have Russian peacekeepers protect the remaining Armenians in Artsakh and Nagorno Karabakh, and to keep a corridor between uh, uh, that region uh, open between Artsakh and Armenia, called the Lachi Corridor. Um, and uh, what happened two years after that, December 2022, uh, the Russian obligation to keep that Lachin corridor collapsed, letting Azerbaijani actors blockade the road through the corridor uh, with no intervention. So um, there was some connection with the International Committee of Red Cross delivering humanitarian supplies until June 2023, this is less than a year ago now, uh, when all transport to Astrakh was caught, cut off and the humanitarian situation just got exponentially worse leading to malnutrition, miscarriages, and medical emergencies unable to be treated. 
Um, by August 2023, uh, Armenians were actually dying of malnutrition within the city, within Artsakh. Um, and I'm a scientist, I tr trust expert opinions, and experts in genocide deemed it an act of genocide at the time. The, the uh, first prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Luis Marnon Campo, wrote a report saying that this is an act of genocide just during this blockade phase. Uh, the Lemkin Institute for the Prevention of Genocide and Genocide Watch all declared an act of genocide in August of 2023. Um, Melanie O'Brien, who's the chair of the International Association of Genocide Cost Scholars, declared an ongoing genocide. Um, and uh, what happened was that September 19th uh, of last year, Azerbaijani military forces came in and completely invaded the whole region, uh, killing over 200 of their security forces and um, that violence led to over 100,000 Armenians that remained in, in the Corner Karabakh or Artsakh to flee, they were forcibly displaced. Um, dozens died on this road, uh, actually trying to wait to get out because it was over, over a days long journey in a car to get through this narrow road uh, for over 100,000 people. Uh, this is just an overview of that, of that, of that uh, traffic jam basically to get out. Um, and that tra traffic jam from one side to the other took days to get through. Um, so, just kind of close now. We had, you know, Armenians in this region, historically, uh, kind of this empire phase of the dark region, and then uh, kind of the greater Armenia that we saw in the uh, Nightline Report here, and then present, uh, present day Armenia now in that, this tiny region here. Um, no Armenians really live anywhere else, a significant number. There is a population in Iran. Um, so uh, the Republic of Armenia is actually the only indigenous Armenian land still populated by Armenians. And the threats by the genocidal and genocide-denying states of Turkey and Azerbaijan continue. Uh, Azerbaijan is not a democracy. It has a dictator that has been handed down from father to son. Uh, uh, since the Soviet uh, Union's collapsed. He declared in the past several years that the Republic of Armenia is in fact Western Azerbaijan. Uh, he denies that the Armenians are actually indigenous to the land or even have any right to live there. Uh, there's a constant actual uh, push of uh, public relations that, uh, to Western powers now that Republic of Armenia is Western Azerbaijan and the people there are the Western Azerbaijan community. Uh, Within that speech, he actually, uh, within a speech in this December of 2022 speech, uh, he, he says that Armenia's existence is completely illegitimate and it occupies the historical lands of Azerbaijan. So not, I don't know what's more genocidal than that, right? Aliyev has also repeatedly threatened to use force to take over Armenian territory to connect to Nahichivan in Turkey, um, which is this exclave. Uh, and Azerbaijan actually also occupies currently in 19, uh, two, over 200 square kilometers in Armenia. September 2022, I was actually uh, visiting uh, Capitol Hill on behalf of the Armenian National Committee, talking to members of Congress. They attacked while we were there in Capitol Hill, killing over 200 Armenians uh, to take over this land. Um, I was in Washington, D.C. last summer, and we went to the Holocaust Museum, and this quote was on the wall. Um, from Adolf Hitler, August 22nd, 1939. Um, he, it's, he said, I have issued the command and I will have anybody who utters but one word of criticism executed by a firing, firing squad, that our war aim does not consist of reaching certain lines, but the physical destruction of the enemy. Accordingly, I have placed my death head formations in readiness for the present only in the east with orders to send them to send, to send to death mercilessly and without compassion, men, women, and children of Polish derivation and language. Only thus shall we gain the living space, new and strong, which we need. Who, after all, speaks today of the annihilation of the Armenians? And so I say, I, I, as an Armenian, I think I say one of the key things that led to the Holocaust was the lack of action on the Armenian genocide. So, but it's also Ongoing today, just prior to the 2020 attack on Artsakh, President Erdogan of Turkey said of Armenia, we will continue to fulfill this mission which our grandfathers have carried out for centuries in the Caucasus region. This is from the President of Turkey. Um, in 2005, the, the municipal, you know, with the municipal delegation of, from Bavaria, Germany, uh, visiting the mayor of Baku, Hajibala Abutalibov, 
stated, our goal is the complete elimination of Armenians. You Nazis already eliminated the Jews in the 1930s and 40s, right? You should be able to understand us. This is in 2005. Putin ally and Kremlin propagandists just this March, a few weeks ago, stated, Armenia will cease to exist within five years. And part of this fits into this kind of pan-Turkic empire that um, Turkish nationalists want to continue. That Turkish war of aggression against Armenia back in 1920, they want to continue it to be able to connect with the Turkic peoples from Turkey out to Central Asia. That's really the end goal for a lot of Turkish nationalists and, and why Armenia stands in the way. So in conclusion, I want to ask you for a call to action. I'm not too over time. Good, I'm not too over time. Uh, I, was, I went to Armenia last summer with the Armenian Society of Fellows, which is a great organization trying to help Armenia uh, through its um, educational institutions. Um, as, as faculty from all over the world are helping this effort. Uh, there's a place that I would call the Cascade, with a nice view of Mount Ararat, uh, was there. And the Turkish border is visible here. It's just right between Yerevan, which is the city here where I was born, and uh, right before the mountain is the border. And it's only about 20 miles away. It's about the distance from here to San Clemente. And, uh, you know, Ar Armenia now is, you know, bordered by two genocide-denying and genocidal states. And uh, I think it's clear to me that eliminating Armenians of Artsakh is just one of the, late, in the latest chapter of the ongoing effort to uh, complete the Armenian genocide. Uh, and it'll happen unless the world intervenes and says, no, actually, never again means something. So um, that's why I give this talk, because I think people should know about how to do this. Um, uh, it reminds me of a quote. Uh, this is an amazing uh, man, Ellie Weasel, a uh, Holocaust uh, survivor, Nobel Prize winning uh, thinker and writer. Um, we must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere. When human lives are endangered, when human dignity is in jeopardy, national borders and sensitivities become irrelevant. Wherever men or women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must, at the moment, become the center of the universe. Uh, and I think sometimes it just goes forward. Uh, and I think this fits into just a cycle of genocide. If you are, you know, saying we've got to kill these people because they're those kind of people, and then goes back the other way. And this is, this is the kind of thing that um, really needs to stop. Um, I chose this picture just because it was on the Armenian Assembly website, and then I, I noticed I know this person. He's a, he's a board member on the board. Um, so uh, last thing I wanted to just put up is, is these, these uh, nonprofits and advocacy organizations. If you want to help out, uh, these are how to, if you know how to use a QR code, this goes to a uh, online version of this talk that's a write-up that I did back in September. Uh, actually, if you don't like the web, and I don't blame you, I have a printout copy of the report that I wrote. You can take one, I have a few here. Uh, if we run out, let me know, I will mail you one. Um, and um, uh, if you follow these links, though, you'll, you'll be able to uh, online give donations if you want. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ken. I re really appreciate all that you've told us and given us that history lesson. Really appreciate it. And now um, uh, we'd like to open it up to um, public comments, if you're willing to, uh, or uh, public questions, if you're willing to answer questions. Sure. Gentlemen, have your questions? Comments? I'm a first generation American. My mother and father both came from a small town up in the mountains of Armenia. And it's important to know that they were lucky. They got away. They were fortunate. But if you spoke to any Armenian family in this country, they would tell you a story just like everybody else's. They were tortured and they were fortunate to get to this country. We never were 
allowed to forget that. And every Armenian family that's here has gone through that type of thing that we just heard about, and no one was left out. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. That's right. Every Armenian family has a story. Um, others? Yes. I came from Iran, and we had Armenian living in Iran for many years. They had their own church and everything. And I actually was working for a school. I mean, I was English teacher for 10 years in an Armenian school, Gulbengian. Uh, but things are, it never get, got so bad as a genocide, but a lot of uh, Armenians had to leave Iran, even after hundreds of years that they were living there and following. But then I keep hearing, I, have, I found my students on Facebook here that they moved from Iran after that. So do you have any information about what, is there any Armenian population there? Or what are they, how are they doing? You know, the Armenians uh, might be doing better than uh, the Persians in Iran. Uh, and a little bit. <laughs> I mean, in that they have a, a slightly more freedoms because they're recognized as a minority that has a protected status. However, they are still under the same political oppression and social yeah. oppression and all, everything yeah. else. Yes, yes just like everybody else. else. Yeah. Um, so a lot of left. I, who's been to Bistango? I like Bistango. So the Irvine establishment here since the 80s. The owners are from Tehran, Armenians from Tehran, and they had a, a restaurant. Their restaurant there was called uh, Chattanooga, I think, which is a very American name. Um, so, um, so anyway, they first moved to Beverly Hills, actually, but then uh, over there only for a couple of years, and they moved to Irvine in the 1980s. It's a really nice restaurant, a little pricey, but it's worth it. Yeah. Um, there's a big community of Armenians in Iran, and who moved, moved here to. I have a very a slightly different perspective on, on this issue. I have a long history uh, of Tur with Turkey and have organized tours for 20 years to Turkey. And I never got any Armenians to come to Turkey. Uh, they would have nothing to do with the country for obvious reasons. <clears throat> but then recently, last summer, I was in Turkey and I met a woman, American, who had been bringing Armenians to Turkey to visit their in central their ancestors' homeland, so it's these small towns in Turkey. And I'm trying to square this up with with all of this history. So, um, yeah, so a lot of Armenians don't feel comfortable going to Turkey and kind of giving their dollars to or you know their money to the people that have occupied the homes and businesses of their ancestors. There is a big propaganda. Wait, the microphone, please. Yeah, let me just finish with this question, though. Um, uh, and I identify with that. I think I would have a hard time going to Turkey um, for that reason. However, uh, Turkish people are very hospitable, um, as long as you don't bring up the genocide. <laughs> um, and they will very happily take your money in a business-like fashion and show you around the and they say, And they say um, that they didn't know what was going on Yeah, there's time. all sorts of things. They did not. They, there's denial, there's I don't know, there's... Um, what, the best way that I, I heard it in the report uh, was the Turkish people today that, I, that may not know the history that uh, because they've been fed an alternative version. They don't want to recognize what happened because it's like saying, it's like, it's like, it would be like saying, yeah, my yogurt is sour. It's like, it's a, it's a little denigration of your identity to, 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 to identify with this horrid past. Um, but unfortunately, I think we have to. I think it's, justice requires it. You can't move on. I mean, you could, we wouldn't at all tolerate a Germany that was denying the Holocaust at any level. 
Um, and I think, unfortunately, we're just slowly getting out of Turkey. I'm hopeful. I think the arc of justice does bend toward, the arc of history does bend towards justice. Um, and I think we will, we'll even get there with Turkey. It may take a long time. Any other comments? Can I have a question? Oh, um, if the Armenian community here pro uh, protesting like some of the other communities, like the Iranian communities or the Pakistani communities, to, uh, requesting U.S. government intervention? There has been. The Armenian community in Orange County is pretty diffuse. There's not, uh, there's kind of a concentration in Santa Ana and uh, like, um, um, Westminster uh, and that area. Um, uh, but there's kind of, it's more, it's pretty diffuse. In Los Angeles, Glendale, Burbank, there's been a lot of protests. They've shut down the freeways. They've uh, protested in front of Adam Schiff's home. They've wow. done all sorts of stuff. I mean, Adam Schiff has been a big advocate for the Armenian community. However, a lot of folks think he hasn't done enough. And um, so I'll just leave it there. Uh, so, what is the relative populations uh, in Armenia and Azerbaijan and Turkey? Well, I'm trying to understand um, the scale of this. Yeah, so um, to uh, I think it's uh, it's I think it's accurate to say there are zero Armenians in Azerbaijan now. There are a few activists that stayed in Artsakh to see what happened. Some are in prison. There are some in prison. Yeah, the only population are those in prison. It's accurate to say um, that that is why they've all left. They they saw what happened in the places that came under control by Azerbaijani forces, and that was uh, that was total subjugation and uh, violence. So they've left, and so and, and as as an Armenian, I could not enter Azerbaijan. I, I actually uh, know a former U.S. Uh, Special Forces soldier that trained in Azerbaijan with Azeri forces. We actually, unfortunately, have a positive military relationship with them. Um, and uh, he actually tried to enter Azerbaijan after the 2020 war and was not allowed to enter the country uh, because of his last name, even though he had a U.S. passport. So it is not, the Armenians are not welcome in Azerbaijan. Um, and in Turkey, I think the estimates I've seen are about 90,000 Armenians that identify as Armenians. Well, what about Armenia itself? How many? What is the population? About 3.2 million, and I think like 95 or 96 percent identify as Armenian. There are some Yazidi, um, Yazidi Kurds, uh, some Russians, uh, other minorities. And what about Azerbaijan? As I said, I think zero percent Armenian. No, but what is the population of Azerbaijan? Oh, the population, um, it is uh, uh, about 20 million, I think, 10 to, between 10 and 20 million. Okay. I'm, a, I'm an astrophysicist, so it's all order of magnitude to me. <laughs> order 10 million. And uh, Turkey is of order 100 million, I think maybe 9 million. So it's a very small country. Armenia is a small country with very large genocidal neighbors. Thank you. Well, I think we've reached the end of our public comment time, and I want to thank you very much, Kev, for coming. Thank you, Susan, for the invitation.